This is Steve Van Kerr of Bread of Life Bible Study. Uh, we're going to have a teaching today on the uh, feasts of Yahweh from Leviticus chapter 23, basically just to see how applicable those feasts are. Of course, uh, the feasts for the most part, have, in a sense, been kicked out of the, the Protestant church, but uh, th there is so much revelation from God about the salvation process in these feasts. We're going to try to integrate the various feasts together to show how they apply to us today. So let's bow our hearts and our heads. Um, Father God, I just thank you for the privilege, Lord, to gather together. And you said, you promised, Lord, that we're two or more of us are gathered together in your name, Lord, that the spirit of truth is right here, the spirit of Christ. Uh, Father God, I just ask you to anoint this word, bring it to life, Lord and uh, impart it into our hearts as living seed, the Word of God. The sower is the Son of Man, the seed is the Word of God, and the soil are the hearts of men. So plant this Word deeply in our hearts, Father. Bring it to life and continue to water it by the Holy Spirit to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold after its likeness, Lord. And that likeness is the likeness of Christ within us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so first, uh, just quick comment, you know, I think I mentioned uh, just before class that uh, Paul said the gospel, the gospel, that's the good news, uh, was actually preached to those under the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, under the co Old Covenant. Uh, we sometimes think that the gospel, oh, that's a something in the New Testament, but no, the, the Word of God is always the gospel. Jesus one time said, uh, speaking to the teachers of the law, of course, their Bible is called the Tanakh. It's basically what we have as the Old Testament. So, uh, but he said to those teachers of the law, he said, you search the scriptures thinking that uh, in them you will find life, but these are they that speak of me. See, he's life. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And I'm telling you what, every jot and tittle, every word, everything in the Old Testament is a, a pattern, in a sense, uh, of, of Christ. It's, it's all about Him, everything. everything. But we cannot see it without the Spirit of God. Uh, the Spirit of God, Jesus one time said, the Holy Ghost, when He comes, He said, you've got an unction from the Holy One, and you have no need that any man should teach you. The Spirit Himself will show you all things. But He said, the, the Holy Spirit will testify of Him. Okay? In other words, Wherever it is, remember the, in Revelation it says the, the spirit of prophecy is what? The testimony of Jesus. That, that's what it's all about. All scripture is prophetic and it's all about him. All right. Uh, all scripture is prophetic, but not all prophecy is scripture. Okay. But you and I, when we get an unction from the Holy One and speak forth the word of God, Guess what? You are speaking prophetically, okay? Any of us can do it, and God expects us to do it because our words must be seasoned with grace. We have to have that Word of God down inside, and it's the Holy Spirit then. Guess what? That He testifies of Christ, okay? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And how do you overcome the devil, Satan? By the blood of the Lamb, and by what? The rhema of your testimony. What you're going to do is you put the Word of God in your mouth, your mouth. God's job is to watch over it, to perform it, to do it, to reveal it, and whatever, you know. And He has done so in these feasts. I think I've mentioned that uh, there are literally 50 chapters in the Bible, if you can imagine, 50, that, that have to do with the Old Testament law, the feasts, uh, the practice of the feast, the tabernacle, the journey through the wilderness, and on and on and on. And guess what? It's all the gospel, all of it, okay? But we can't see it until we get the Holy Ghost and uh, God turns the light on, if that makes sense, okay? So, um, the, like I said, the, you know, we sometimes think or are under the impression that the law is going to pass away. Well, in a sense, the law is passing away, as Paul said in Hebrews, okay? But it, it's not going to pass away until it's all fulfilled. And how, what's the fulfillment? Is in the New Covenant when it's written on our hearts. 
And then there's no need for the outside, you know, because uh, the, purpose, the purpose of the Old Testament was to show the old man, the, the, the flesh, you know, so that it could be killed. The letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. And, and that's, that's what this law is all about. Sometimes, now, if, if I'm a born-again Christian and I haven't yet crucified 100% the flesh, then guess what? That unredeemed part of me, well, it's not, it, I'm redeemed, but I'm just saying the part of the flesh that's still there and trying to resurrect sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, that part of me is still under the law, okay? Because until the whole part of the old man is completely dead, okay, then the, the law still applies, okay? Because is, if I'm tempted, it's and by the devil. Remember, he eats of the flesh, all, or I'm sorry, the, the, the dust all the days of his life. Well, what's that? That's the flesh, you know? And so when he's trying to come against me, the only part of me that's going to respond is the old man. That's it, okay? And, and, the, and the only reason that happens is so when it sticks its ugly head up, then I can take the sword of the Spirit <laughs> and chop his head off, okay? Uh, if that makes sense. So it, this is a process. This is a process. Salvation is not say this little prayer and you're done. No, no. But he that began a good work in you will carry it unto completion you know, under the day of Christ Jesus, all right? Uh, Jesus Christ has made him into this wisdom from God, okay? And, uh, sanct or I'm sorry, and uh, uh, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's the salvation of the spirit, the soul, and the body, okay? The redemption is also sometimes, you might call it glorification. That's when the whole thing's over, and uh, we become, not, you know, we're already the temple of the living God, but one day that manifest glory of God is going to shine out from our hearts, okay? Uh, and the, um, that, that's the fulfillment of these feasts, okay? Now, um, everything in the natural is always fulfilled spiritually. That, that's just, you can write that down and, uh, and count on it, okay? Uh, if we take anything from, from the Old Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, also called the Eternal Covenant, that's the Covenant of Grace, well, guess what? The sign of the covenant was circumcision, you know. And, you, you know, if you weren't circumcised, guess what? You were cut off the covenant. You, you could not be a member of that covenant. And the same thing is true now, you know. You cannot enter and stay. You, you cannot enter into heaven and you cannot, um, you know, enjoy the kingdom of God for eternity unless you are circumcised, okay? Now, again... Most people are busy thinking in the natural. You, see, you know, they will stumble all over that, okay? What are you talking about, you know? Uh, that doesn't apply to us anymore, okay? But Paul finally got a revelation. He who is a Jew, you know, is not one who is circumcised physically in the flesh, but no, circumcision that God's talking about is circumcision of the spirit or of the heart by the spirit. The same thing is true for everything, everything, okay? It's all about him, remember? So uh, Colossians tells us that, that our relationship in our born-again experience with Christ, the circumciser, who is Christ, that he cuts away the flesh, okay? Now that doesn't mean the old man, once again, is dead for good. It only means that the new man is birthed in you. And who's that new guy? All right. Well, remember that scripture? It says, he that is born of God does not sin. He cannot sin because God's seed indwells him. Now, you look at that and, you, oh my God, what's that talking about? Well, that is talking about the born again life of Christ inside of you. He will never lead you to sin. He'll never, you know, he, he is your anchor. Okay? And, and, uh, but, when he is in you, in your holy of holies, guess what? You are holy. Okay? Now, it's holiness that's going to work its way out to the rest of your being. Okay? But he's in you. All right? And he that began a good work in you will 
carried into completion. Is this making sense? You know, so in a sense, when we're born again, remember, we're kind of schizophrenic. All right? uh, you probably run into some of those, okay? <laughs> but you know, the reality is, uh, you know, our, our day-to-day process is to take up our cross, and uh, as God reveals strongholds of the enemy, that then we, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh so that we can truly live, okay? Live in freedom. Christ came to set us free, all right? And, and uh, uh, you know, I am who he says I am, regardless of whatever, you know, the flesh jumps up and does something. That's not who I am, okay? That's what Paul figured out finally in Romans 7. That's not me. It's sin that indwells me. But God's given me the power. And if I, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, then, you know, that, that flesh cannot control me anymore. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I have to look at what God says. Not what I feel. Not what I experience. All right? It, because I walk by faith. Not by feelings, not by sight, whatever. I have to totally discount all those things that will try to trip me up and think that's who I am. All right? Making sense? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, there's a little list here, a table of, of the feasts of Yahweh. Uh, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, also called, we call Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. That's the, the seven feasts in Leviticus 23. All right. Uh, we are first introduced to these, uh, of course, in Exodus chapter 12, where uh, Moses comes into, the, into Egypt and uh, says to Pharaoh, set my people free. Okay. And, and uh, this is where we're first introduced to the Lamb of God. And uh, they choose the lamb on the 10th day of the month. And four days later at Erev, okay, they, which is at sundown basically, they take that little lamb to the doorpost, or to, I'm sorry, to the, to the doorway of their house, and they slit its throat. And then they take the plant called hyssop, which I guess kind of looks like a shape of a paintbrush or something. And they take that blood and they apply it in the form of a cross on the doorposts and lintel of the house. Remember that? And then when the destroyer comes over at the time of the 10th plague, they are protected. All right. And, and remember, the death of the firstborn represents the fir- firstborn of the human race is Adam. And what's our problem with Adam? Uh, you know, when we're descended from Adam, we have a sin nature. And the soul that sins must die. We are under a death penalty, okay? And, and that's, that's the, the plague of the firstborn, that, that without applying the blood of the lamb to our house, which represents us, that's me. I'm a house, okay? I'm, I'm a house, all right? And, and I will either house uh, the life of God or the life of the devil. When I'm born, guess what? Satan is my father before I'm born again. Remember, we've, I think we said there are only two spiritual fathers in the entire earth. That's it, two. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. All right? And the only other spiritual father is God. And when we're born of the Spirit, that's when um, the, la- the, fir- the, the last Adam, Jesus, is conceived in us through the Word of God. And uh, all of a sudden, we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Okay? Now, uh, it, let me say that Jesus fulfilled the spring feast at His first coming. I mean, I'm telling you in absolutely every which way that... Um, he ended up, he was the Passover lamb, okay? He died on the cross and, uh, and took the penalty for all mankind. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. All right, now, uh, these 
feasts, every last one of them, are, uh, must be completely, absolutely, every jot and tittle fulfilled in him. Remember, that's what we said, that <coughs> until heaven and earth pass away, <coughs> the law will never pass away until it's all fulfilled, and its fulfillment is always in Christ. Okay, does that make sense? But where are you and I? In Him. In Him. So whatever, whatever He has to fulfill, I have to fulfill. And I do fulfill it because I'm in Him. Wherever He goes, I go. All right? Does that make sense? Nobody goes to heaven except who comes down from heaven. This is where people come up with this thing of, you know, I don't know, people come up with this idea of predestination. And, that, and certainly there is a predestination, you know, but, and, but the way that's improperly interpreted is that before you were born, before time, before you became a person on this earth, God decided in advance whether you're going to be saved or not saved. You know, I mean, the Bible kind of says whosoever will, you know. Well, but predestination says, well, God's going to go ahead and decide for you. You just don't have any say in it, you know. He's the one that decides who's going to get saved and who doesn't get saved. And if he decides against you, well, I'm sure sorry. But, and that they teach limited atonement. That, in fact, Jesus died not for the sins of the whole world, even though that's what the Bible says, they say, oh, no, no, he only died for those that are chosen and those that are going to inherit eternity. That's it. He didn't die for those other guys. So, well, it's just watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one deceives you. Okay. So where he goes, I go. All right. Remember that promise that, uh, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, <laughs> Ah, I forgot. Uh, uh, never mind. Forget it right now. I can't think, can't think of her name. There's a character in the Bible that, that kind of made that statement. Uh, that where you go, I go. Your God, will be my God. Uh, Naomi. Naomi. Okay, yeah. Naomi. Oh, Ruth. Ruth, Ruth said it to Naomi. You know, yeah. Ruth was a Moabitess. Of course, she was outside the covenant. Uh, but her husband was Jewish. And when he died, um, you know, uh, Naomi took her uh, to... Israel, and, uh, you know, Naomi said to her, well, eh, go on, you can go on back to the Moabites and whatever. She said, no way, you know. Where you go, I go. Your God will be my God, and on and on. And uh, far be it from me that anything but death would separate you and I. Well, that's a commitment, see, and that's the commitment we need to make to the God of Israel, okay? That's the commitment, okay? So um, when we make that commitment to Christ, after being, he's revealed by the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, who do men say that I am? Or do I get a testimony from God? Who does God say that he is? Okay. But see, once I'm born, once I'm in him, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Then absolutely every jot and tittle that applies in the Old Testament that he fulfills, remember, it's all about him. Guess what? I have to fulfill the same thing, you see, because I'm along for the ride, see. Where he goes, I go, all right. Nobody goes to heaven or enters the kingdom of God except he who comes down from heaven, you see. So predestination is simply whether I decide to get on that bus or not, okay. And, and if I choose him, all right, and commit to him, like Ruth did to Naomi, all right, then... I got it. Yeah, I enter into the kingdom, okay? And all the promises that are made are yes and amen in him. Does that make sense? Okay? So, all of these feasts, they're not just some historical story. That, My friend, they are directly, absolutely, and fully applicable to me, okay? And, uh, but see... Um, he said, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. All of these feasts were practiced in this place called the Mishkan, the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And what is it that tabernacle all about? Is how can a sinful person 
approach a holy God. That's what it's about. You know, so it, you know, that, that's what I need to know. It's a step by step, you know, one piece of furniture after another, one door, the eastern gate, that's the way, and the truth is the holy place, and the life is the holy of holies. When he said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, he's talking about these three parts, you know, of this t tabernacle in the wilderness, you know, and, and once I'm born again, I am the tabernacle of God, all right? He lives in me. I'm not my own anymore. I've been bought with a price, you know, therefore honor God with your bodies, you see. But see, we don't know how sometimes to be submitted to God and to experience the promises. These promises are all, like I said, this, whole, these, this gospel is codified, represented in these feasts, all right? And the feasts, the Hebrew word is mo'adim, which simply means an appointment in time. They're also called holy convocations. All right, the, the Hebrew word for there is a mikra, which means a rehearsal. It's a rehearsal, all right? At the, all of these are a rehearsal, just kind of like when you get married, you know, before you actually go do it. Uh, I, I mean, get married. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you first uh, have a rehearsal. Okay, does that make sense? And, and in the rehearsal, is where you kind of practice and understand the principles, what you're going to do. That's when you're going to, uh, you know, the, the, the pastor says, okay, here's, you know, here's how this is going to go. All right. But then when the day of reckoning comes, all right, uh, that's when it's enacted. Does that make sense? And once you say, I do, and she says, I do, then behold, and now under the authority given to me, I pronounce you husband and wife. All right. Now, the same thing is kind of true for these feasts, okay? Uh, they are rehearsals. They are, each of them represents an aspect of salvation. Now, of course, Passover, we talked about, that's when this curse on me called the death of the firstborn, boom, that fast, you know? Once I apply the blood of the lamb, now, of course, four days before, guess what? They had to choose the lamb, all right? See, you know, I, I can't accept Christ till God reveals to me, by revelation, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, okay? And then, and then you know, so I, I, once I know, by revelation, that's him, all right? Then I have to make a decision, you see, to confess his lordship, to, to make my commitment, okay? Kind of like uh, Ruth did to, you know, to Naomi, okay? Uh, and it's by your mouth, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lordship of Christ and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead and payment for my sins, you know, then God, he was the one that watches over his word to perform it. All right, now, each step is along that line. The next feast, of course, is Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is a seven-day feast. And uh, the first, this is the 15th to the 21st of Abib. And, and uh, the first day and the last day are what they call High Sabbaths, okay? And uh, they, uh, every kind of Sabbath, there's only two kinds of Sabbath. There's a High Sabbath and a Weekly Sabbath, if that makes sense, okay? And, uh, of course, the day before any kind of Sabbath is called Preparation Day. Now, then that's why people get so turned around and confused reading the gospel accounts of, of uh, this, the, you know, the Passover era, okay, period, when Jesus was crucified, because they don't know one Sabbath from another. They don't know one preparation day from another. Uh, and if you don't have an understanding of these things, then it just, you know, you just have to say, well, somebody told me that he, you know, was crucified on Friday, he rose again on Sunday, now, how that counts out three days and three nights, I don't know, but that's what they said, you know. Well, look out. So, anyway, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, again, a mikra. It's, it's a rehearsal. And what is it? What do you do on the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Clean house, man. You clean house, okay? 
And, and that's where you look throughout the house for, I'm telling you, any and every crumb of sin. The leaven. Because if you let it in there, it's, it's uh, like a fungus. It's going to grow. And um, a little bit of leaven works its way through the whole batch of dough. And so uh, God gives us the power. But you can't do Feast of Unleavened Bread until you first do Passover. Right? You first got to apply the blood, which now what happens is, is now you become the house of the living God through the you know, uh, birth of Christ in you, if that makes sense. All right, and now that's the power. Remember, that's that anchor. He who uh, knew no sin became sin for us. And, and his life in us now gives us the power to say no to sin but only as we submit to him. Now, let me ask you a question. Can a Christian sin? The answer, you, you know the answer, as much as you want to, okay? You still have a will. A Christian can sin as much as they want to, okay? But the problem is, he who sows to the flesh will, from the flesh, reap corruption. James tells us that sin is like a seed. And it begins little, just little, you know. But if we don't do something about it, weed it out, yank it up, then guess it just grows and grows. And it, the ultimate end of sin is death. All right? That's just the way it is. The law does not change. Okay? Uh, but now, see, before we didn't have the power to do what God said. That's... God's standard of right and wrong is the law. But the problem is, I can promise all I want to. You know, New Year's resolutions, I'll never do that again. Well, get, I'm going to do it again. So, but now we have the power. All right, the first step is to clean out the leaven because every little bit of leaven is a seed for more. Every bit, okay? So, and, you know, so these... It's so important to understand these, and I'm telling you, as you go read the details in Scripture about these, the light of the Spirit turns on and begins to show uh, more and more understanding about how to apply these in our lives, okay? Jesus one time said, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, all right? Watch out for the leaven of Herod, all right? Well, those are two different kinds of leaven, Okay. But the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who mixed a little bit of leaven in a, you know, in a batch of dough and it worked its way through the whole thing. So leaven can be either good or bad. All right? It's a seed, like so many things in, in Scripture. It's a seed. And there's good leaven, which is the Word of God, and watered by the Spirit of God, it will grow. All right? But it, like... Paul in the first Corinthians when he was scolding them because there was a man in the church that was sleeping with his father's wife. He said, man, you got to do something about this. You must do something about this because now everybody, everybody's going to think it's okay. All right. But he said, you know, if anyone is caught in a sin, let he who is spiritual go and restore them gently. If anyone, there's, there's a mistranslation of a a scripture that says, if anyone sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But see, against you is in italics, okay? Which means that it wasn't there in the original text. In other words, so if anybody sins, if, you, you have, if you're in a body of believers and there's somebody, you know, in your body that's living it up, having a good time, feeding the flesh, it's, you know, you, you kind of have a responsibility to go to that person and say, hey, man, uh, you know, um, you're kind of out of control here, you know. Uh, and, but with love. Remember, Paul said, he who is, let him who is spiritual go and re restore him gently. You can't find the, the speck in your brother's eye unless you first take the log out of your own. You see, so we, the person that has the wisdom, the heart, okay, 
to restore somebody that's caught in sin. And believe me, there's lots of people that are caught in sins. Lots of them. Lots of them. They're, they're busy going to church. Okay? And, but the, the problem is, they don't know how to get out of it. They don't, you know, because everybody else is doing it. And, and they're taught, we're all just sinners saved by grace. Everybody sins. You can't be holy in this life. Well, if I believe that, because that's what I've been told by my elders, then guess what? That's the way I'm going to live my life. Why try to be holy? I can't. Nobody can. You see? Well, that's the problem with false doctrines. That's it. Okay? So the truth will set us free. And the minute I understand the truth and begin to apply it by faith, man out of nowhere, not out of nowhere, but the grace of God shows up. You see, and empowers me to say no to sin. Okay, does that make sense? You know, but a righteous man may fall seven times before he finally figures out how to walk. And, that, and that's at the, the church, the body, is a family. All right, and just like when you have kids at home, you've got a responsibility, you know, to take care of your kids, to protect them, to educate them, to nurture them, you know. And, and that applies not only to spiritual things, but to physical things, all right? So the family of God is no different, no different, okay? And, and uh, uh, we have an obligation, all right? Now, uh, unfortunately, that's not always shared even by leadership. They, they may have wrong doctrines also. And, and, and um, you know, they, they don't know what to do. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Well, anyway, in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is when the Feast of First Fruits occurs. Feast of First Fruits. Now, what is this? This is the springtime. It's the time of the barley harvest. They, now, there's, um, remember, three uh, harvest periods in Israel. One is the barley harvest. That's a, a grain. Next is the wheat harvest in the summertime. This is the time of Pentecost. And then there's the grapes and olives and all that kind of stuff in the fall, all right? Um, and the Bible tells us that the Bible commands that three times a year, the, the men of a household are supposed to go to Jerusalem uh, to, to celebrate, to practice uh, these feasts, okay? Because, once, once again, they are, in a sense, the, the means by which we understand the salvation process and how to experience the freedom uh, of obedience to God is. See? Deuteronomy 28 tells us that if we obey the commands of God, an abundance of blessings results. But if we disobey God's commands, well, remember who the minister of the curse is? The devil, you know. And, and um, my um, house, me, okay, Remember we said it's, it's a house, okay? Well, guess what? Houses have doors. They got windows, you know? And uh, it's just like if I'm in a bad neighborhood, why do we lock the door, you know? Because there's some bad guys out there. And, and you don't just leave your door unlocked or leave your door open or, or whatever because you just don't know who's going to come wandering by, okay? And, and that's the way my, my life is. Okay, God, just like to Job, when I'm in good standing with him, there's a hedge around me, my friend. There's a hedge. All right, and, and the angels of God guard and protect his people. Psalm 91 is, is true. And, and, um, but see, if I give place to the devil, Paul said, give no place to the devil. The word is topos. Okay, which means like topography. That's where we get that. Well, my soul is my promised land. Okay, and the goal of my salvation, or the goal of my faith, is the salvation of my soul. That's my mind, my will, and my emotions, where I make decisions about what to do, not to do, you know, and, and uh, where I process, in a sense, the input from the spirit realm and the physical realm. And, and uh, decide, okay, this is the way I'm going to live my life. Okay, does this make sense? 
Okay, uh, but if you know if I leave a door open to my house uh, uh, on purpose, you know, a temptation comes by and I'd open open the door, and let them in. Well, that's you know then consequences can occur. Okay, but all right. So, uh, but like I said, that barley is a grain. It's part of the harvest. Barley is the, the, the first grain that come ripe. Jesus is called the first fruits of the harvest, of those that were rose, rise from the dead. The first fruits of the dead, I, I guess I should say. And, and uh, uh, now, what's interesting, you know, barley is the easiest of the grains to separate from the shaft. Uh, to um, ready for use, I guess I should say, okay? Uh, you know, grain like wheat uh, it has a shaft on it and you have to process it, okay? You've got to, uh, let's see, what's the term called when you beat it and... Threshing, okay, you, the threshing, okay? Uh, barley is, uh, the shaft is eat, just barely attached to the grain. It, it just takes a little bit of light thrashing and then winnowing, which is to toss it up from the threshing floor, and the wind blows away the shaft, and what falls down is just the good old grain. So it's ready. Now all you got to do is process it into flour and turn it into something to eat, okay? Now, wheat is a little different. Wheat requires much more thorough threshing, all right? And in fact, the way they used to do it is that they had a platform, a platform of wood on the bottom of the, of the thing were all kinds of hunks of metal and rocks and these, they, that kind of stuff to roughen it up. And then they would uh, pull it around with like a donkey or an ox or something like that, and somebody would stand on that uh, threshing sledge, they called it, okay? And, and they drag it over the wheat, and then that, that of course, would beat, beat the wheat so that it separate the shaft from the stalk and all that kind of thing. Then when they would winnow it, of course, the wind, which is a type of the Holy Ghost, that blows away the shaft, which is a type of the corruption or a sin, and, you know, and, and, and separate it to, to ready it. Does that make sense? Now, here's what's interesting. Do you know what that threshing sledge was called in Latin? The tribulum. The tribulum. Okay? Because, you know, consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you encounter trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You know, as grains, see, there are different kinds of people. And the... the, the um, Barley represents those who mature quickly and with just a little bit of threshing are purified to be acceptable to God. Does that make sense? But the wheat are the more common and abundant uh, crop that requires a little more threshing, okay, to knock off the grain and, uh, you know, requires, requires God in his love, see, in his love, he'll, he will give us whatever trials we need, you know, to purify us. Because, see, that's his promise. What, what is his covenant? That I take away their sins. I'll take away their sins. And, uh, you know, if we just soar on through life and never have a problem, never have, never even need to call on God because you got it all. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing, okay? Okay. Uh, God allows trials and difficulties literally for our good. All things work together to good for those who love the Lord. And I'm telling you, it all does. When you're in the middle of it, somebody said one time, you're either between trials, going into a trial, in the midst of a trial, coming out of a trial, or whatever. We're always there somewhere, okay? That's what the wilderness was about in this journey, this exodus from Egypt to the Promised Land. The wilderness is a type of the, this world system where there's a whole lot of things we got to go through. And every one of them is a lesson. 
Now, God does not want us to spend 40 years going around and around and around and around Sinai, okay? He wants us to get on in the promised land. And that's holiness. The promised land represents holiness. He's already given us the land. He's given us everything we, ne we need, everything necessary to enter the promised land. And the Bible says that, it, 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 that the promised land is as heaven on the earth. This is where, you know, because of obedience with God, and of course the, the crossing, there's two bodies of water to cross. One is the Red Sea, which is a type of water baptism. That's where the old man dies, you know, and the, the one comes up on the, new, on the other side, of course, is the new man, all right? But everybody goes through the wilderness. Everybody has to go through the wilderness, all right? And Jesus, after he was filled with the Holy Ghost, he was led by the Spirit, where? Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Bible says he was perfected through suffering. He, well, even him, okay? Remember, absolutely 100%, everything he has to go through, he does go through, I have to go through. It's the same thing. It's the same. Now, what is exempt? Does that make sense? But a, there's a whole, remember, there's only an 11 day journey from Sinai to the Jordan River. That's it, 11 days. They showed up at Kadesh Barnea, and God said, You know, I've given you the land. I've given you the land. Go get it, go take it. But remember, unbelief will keep us out of the promised land. Unbelief will tell us, I can't be holy in this life. It's impossible. Nobody can. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Is all this making any sense? You know, you know, it, this is the message of, of, I'll just say, the time, all right? There's a time for every purpose under heaven. And, and these, remember, these feasts are appointments in time. And the, this, the generation that couldn't go into the promised land, remember, died in the wilderness. And Paul warns us. He said, just as they didn't make it in because of unbelief, so also it's possible that we, can, we don't enter into holiness, okay, because of unbelief, all right? But in the, every generation, God is in control of the happenings for that generation. God is. In the fullness of time, God sent his one and only son. God had, you know, he was crucified before the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? But the God decided when he was going to manifest and, and present himself as Messiah to Israel. All right? We are what's called the final generation. Remember we talked about that? When you look at the genealogy in Matthew of Messiah, remember that? 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations, supposed to add up to 42. But guess what? It doesn't add up to 42. Because it's 14 and 14 and 13. And so you look at that and you say, well, gosh, you know, Somebody made a clerical error here or something, you know. Well, who's the final generation? It's the final offspring of the seed. That's us, okay? And remember, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former house. In these latter times, this is the time of the latter rain. This has to do, once again, with the harvest. Every, this, that's what this is all about, the harvest of the earth. And the harvest of the earth is people. This whole business is all about God wants a family. A family, okay? So uh, there, we are in a very, very unusual time. But you, my friend, were absolutely, positively chosen. Who knows but that you were chosen. For a time of this. Well, you are. So just like Esther. Esther, I mean, that was her destiny. She was born for a purpose, okay? And, and um, 
the things that were going on there, uh, you know, uh, oh, Haman, Haman, okay, I was trying to think of the bad guy, <laughs> you know, uh, he's a type of the devil, he's a type of the Antichrist, and of course he had plans to kill all the Jews, and you know, and cooked up this scheme, and and somehow or another, guess what? That king himself gave him, passed a law, gave him permission to, to kill all the Jews, to steal all their wealth and that kind of stuff. Because the law said that once a king makes a law, a decree, it can't be changed. It cannot be changed. But Esther, one day at dinner, <laughs> you know, reveals this guy Haman, you know, and uh, the king finally figures out that, that uh, he's got to protect his bride. He is going to protect his bride. So he can't change the law, which gave Haman the power to destroy the people of God, but he passed another law, or another law so that they could defend themselves and overcome them. All right? So he passed that law, and sure enough, so when the war started, in a sense, okay, and, and Haman and the bad guys started attacking uh, the, the Jews, the Jews were victorious and won the battle, destroyed them all, okay? Well, now, if we look at the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, God himself said that he, gave the power to the beast to persecute the saints mm -hmm. for a time, times, and half a time, okay? God did that. Mm -hmm. And what's that for? The tribulum. All right? The tribulum to refine his people so they would be tried in fire. and be as pure as gold, as pure as gold, okay? And when, you know, of course, when you're in the midst of that, you're wondering, well, where's God? Where's God? But, and we often wonder that, what's going on? What's going on? Why am I going through all these trials, you know? But we must always keep our eyes on the prize, on the promises, in the midst of everything, refresh our faith with the promises of God. All right? We are those who through faith and patience, that means it doesn't come overnight, okay, inherit the promises. All right? And that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Now, we don't like reading that part, but that's, that's what it says, you know. But when it's all said and done, we'll find out that was the absolute very... See, the, the Bible says that we are... God will not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able. Amen. So just keep that in mind. Okay. He will never, 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 never put more on you than you can handle through Him. But it's always through Him. Amen. But He will always... Bring you to the place where it's 11.59. And, and it looks like there's no hope, but there's always hope. All right? But it's just the way God is. You know, he, he will bring you to the brink so that you got no choice. You finally figure out, I cannot save myself. So we have to look up, look up. Does that make sense? You know, that's, that's what we're in for. So, uh, and, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. We have to decide in advance. See, when they start passing the mark around and they start saying, well, you can't feed your family or you whatever, here's some bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. We have to decide in advance. Yeah. Absolutely. Who are you going to serve? If you don't decide in advance, then you will waffle when the choices come. I'm just telling you that. That's the problem with being lukewarm. All right? I, I, 
I, I just can't overemphasize that. All right? Set our minds like flint. Just commit. Commit when there's no back door. There's no back door. We just 100% commit, commit, commit. And God, man, he's going to stand behind the commitment. He will. He will show himself strong on our behalf. Okay? Psalm 91 is something we are going to have to experience. You know, it just, um, you know, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him will I trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. I mean, it, the promises are yes and amen in him. They just are, okay? But, you know, I can't be flipping around trying to find, now where was that scripture? What, what, let's see, I remember there was a scripture about something, you know. Uh, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We must, you know, like David, I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, sin, remember, they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. What did God call it? Sin. We have to believe God. Just believe Him. Does this make sense? You know, uh, can we see how this, this, you know, these feasts apply? Every jot and tittle applies. All right. Now, you know, feast of trumpets uh, is has to do with the second coming. This is the only feast that occurs uh, in the lunar calendar on the first day of the month, the first day. And remember that the um, from one new moon to another is is 29.5 days. So basically, the you know you go out and you look at the moon every day and you follow that. But the the new moon uh, basically uh, the month doesn't start until you see the first sliver of light on a new moon. Then every every month every month that you see that sliver of light. You know, they always blow the shofar because this is what they call Rosh Chodesh. The head of the month, okay? New month, okay? All right? But you see, this, this one, Feast of First Fruits, like I said, you never know whether it's that month, the month, you know, before is going to be 29 days or 30 days, okay? Because you can't, you can't declare the new month until you see that sliver of light. So the way they did that is they'd have watchers, watchers up there on the Temple Mount, what, you know, looking at, waiting for that sliver of light, you know. The minute they saw that sliver of light, you know, they'd verify in the mouth of two or three witnesses, okay, and they'd run up to the, tell the high priest, and the high priest would immediately declare this as the holiday, Yom Torah, the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, and and so, and it was known for literally three thousand years is the feast that occurs at a time when no man knoweth the day or the hour. All right. So when that phrase was used, everybody who was familiar with the feast knew exactly what was being said. To to people that don't know the feast and don't understand how it works. They thought they were just so, yeah, nobody has the foggiest idea when, when the, he's coming back, you know. Um, but see, that's just not the case. That, that he's telling us exactly. Now, he, he says, we don't know the day or the hour, but that's what that phrase is. You don't, whenever that little sliver of light is seen, only the Father knows. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? Now, uh, but when that, there's a 10-day period from the first of this month, this is Tishri, okay, that, that's the Babylonian name, so after they came back from Babylon, they called it the month of Tishri. Oh, man, I'm out of time. Uh, uh, but then the next day, 10 days later, is Yom Kippur. This is Day of Atonement. This is when God kind of settled, you know, makes the judgment about whether you're a good boy or a bad boy, or a good girl or a bad girl, you know, and and basically the tradition was that there's three books, you know, the, the book of life, the book of death, 
and the book of sort of in between. Let's wait till next year, you know. And but the, the phrase was as people the ten day period is called the days of awe, and it's a period of repentance. When you know the time that we're near the time of the end, what do we do? Repent. Be ready. Okay. Have the people wash themselves. Because on the third day, I'm coming down in full sight of all the people. Well, that's what Moses said from, you know, back in the Old Testament. You know, and that's what God said. Have the people wash themselves and put on clean garments. Because on the third day, which is the seventh day, same thing, okay, I'm coming down in full sight of all the people. All right? Anyway, the, these... Feasts are amazing. So I'm going to close with prayer um, and um, just encourage everyone to, to, to study these things. I mean, man, it's just amazing. Every time you look at it more and more, uh, God will turn some more lights on and we understand and see how they apply to us. And they, believe me, they do. They do. Okay? So let's bow our hearts and our heads. And we just thank you, Father, for your word. It is a living word, and it never returns void. It's like a great light in the heavens, Lord, and it all testifies of Christ. And just as whatever he goes through, and that's what these feasts are all about, all 50 chapters of them, uh, of all these practices of the law, ceremonial law, civil law, and the royal law. Father, just I thank you, Lord, that this is given to us for our admonition, our teaching, our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. We are the chosen generation, the final generation. Father, even now, Father, you're working through us, Lord, to prepare a great harvest. And Father, just you said, let pray to the Lord of harvest that we'd send out workers into the harvest field. And Father, just touch all of our hearts, Father, to you're the Lord. And uh, just uh, let us be fruitful, fruitful, intending to your harvest. In Jesus' name, amen.